We have a beautiful feast today, the feast of the Mother of God's entrance into the temple. What a joy it is to celebrate one of the great 12 feasts of the church on Sunday. It uh, doesn't always happen, but it's a joy that we get a chance to uh, share together and joy in this, uh, this festive day. So let's talk about uh, what this festive day really means, right? Let's talk about it. In relationship to, uh, to Mary, we have this temple, right? Okay, so we're talking about the mother of God when she was very little, at three years old. A little background story. She was first uh, conceived by Joachim and Anna by a, a miraculous experience in that uh, she was not able to have children for most of her life until she got very old and pleaded with God. And God allowed her to bear this wonderful child. So even Mary's birth was a bit of a miracle itself just because of how uh, she was conceived at such uh, a late age by, uh, by Anna. But as one of the things that Anna said when she prayed, she said, okay, I would love to be pregnant, but Lord, I will dedicate her to you if you will give me a child. And because in those days especially, to have a child, just to have a child, was a, a blessing from God. And if you didn't have children, you were considered not blessed by God, and you were shunned. And really, Joachim and Anna were shunned for most of their life, okay? Up until their elder years, they were kind of outcasts socially in, in Israel because they did not have children. So it was considered not a blessing, right? You might say a curse, right? And so she felt like that her whole life, that she had been cursed. But after this prayer and this pleading, God answered her prayer, and she became pregnant. And we know, because on September 9th, we celebrate her birth, right? But today is the fulfillment of that prayer, right? Because the mother of God said, oh, I mean, the, the mother of the mother of God said, uh, I'm going to dedicate this child to you. And Joachim and Anna did that. At the age of three, they brought her to the temple and gave her to the temple to live in the temple and to pray and to learn the ways of God. And that's how she was dedicated. Now, many years ago, we can remember the story of Samuel, right? How Samuel was dedicated to God by Hannah in a similar way. And so this is true, and this is what happened. So Mary, here on this day that we're celebrating today, is brought to the temple. And I want you to contemplate what the temple is, because really, this is, I think, the center of what this feast really means. Mary was brought to the temple. Now, the temple is a little bit different than our temple, but similar. It had 15 steps going up into the main part of the temple. And then you walk through a big section that would be like this, like the main. And then she went right up these stairs and into the Holy of Holies. And this was something that was not done. We heard even in our epistle reading today, right? We heard that the priest goes into the temple once a year to make a sacrifice. That's it, once a year. And even then, when he went in, they would wrap a rope around his waist in case he did something he shouldn't have done. <laughs> and he would die in the altar because this, this could happen. And then they would have to pull him out. So it was very rare that anyone went into the temple, uh, and especially the Holy of Holies. And here, the Mother of God goes up the stairs, and, and Zacharias, by the way, was the, uh, the priest at the time, uh, and he was, of course, John the Baptist's father. And he took him, he took Mary, up the stairs and right in to the Holy of Holies. And you can imagine, as soon as this happened, <gasps> everyone's catching their breath, right? Going, what in the world are they doing? This is how special and significant Mary was. Zacharias knew it. How all the virgins and the black candle lighters that came on the way, which was tradition, they all knew something was different about this little girl. And what was different about her, we sing about in our hymns today, don't we? We express them, and I'll read a couple for you. Um, we sang this last night. Rejoice, O heaven and earth, beholding the only immaculate virgin, the noetic heaven coming forth to be raised in honor in the house of God. To her did Zechariah cry out, marveling, O portal of the Lord, I opened unto thee the gates of the temple. Rejoice therein, join in chorus, for I have come to know and believe that the deliverance of Israel is manifestly coming, and that God the Word will be born of you, granting the world great mercy. 
mercy. We sing this. This is the joy of our hearts because we know that Mary is directly connected to Jesus. That Jesus took his flesh from Mary to become a man like us. So we have a lot of really uh, hope in the mother of God because not only did he do that in that he took part of her which she gave willingly but he also allowed his mother of God his mother to have the influence around all of us and even around the disciples to pray for them to even tell the Lord as we know from the wedding of Cana what to do and when to start the ministry so the mother of God is very important now I want to talk a little bit about the temple. Before I became an Orthodox Christian, I was a Christian, and I worshipped in uh, many places of worship, and all the places that I worshipped in, though, were usually just buildings, right? They were just spaces where the people got together, which, you know, initially makes a lot of sense. It is true, right, that the church is actually the people of God, right? But one of the things that I've always lacked growing up was a sense of holiness, a sense of sacredness, a sense that when you walk into a place, you have a different feeling. You have a, a different even posture, right? I mean, just notice the saints around us right now in the larger icons. And how notice all of the saints have a humble posture, right? They're all sort of leaning forward and, and, and in a slight bow. Even this bodily posture, right, is a way in which the saints teach us how to express our worship. And in many churches that I was at, there was worship where, you know, hands were raised and people were jumping over pews and being real loud and crazy, you know. And, I, you know, there's a place for that. I mean, David, the great uh, psalm writer, said he danced naked before he got to the temple, you know, and big crowds and parties and everything. Fine outside the temple. But once you came into the temple, there were certain requirements, right? The temple was laid out in a certain way in Israel. Very specific. How many of you have read through the entire Bible? Okay, a few of you. If you've read through the entire Bible, I encourage you, when you get to, like, Exodus, you're going to begin to see this development of the temple. And for the next two books of the Bible, Pretty much the temple is talked about over and over again. That's how significant the creation of the temple was. So God set up the order of the temple. The way it's set up today mirrors the way our parish is. Now the parishes and the churches that I went to were not patterned that way. Many times they were just big boxes. Sometimes they were made in a circle. Sometimes they were made in all different kinds of ways, which is fine and nice, but I still felt like I was missing something, right? And one day, my brother invited me to go to an Orthodox church. And I went to the Orthodox church in the evening for a Vesper service. And it was candle lits were very low, and the icons were just kind of gleaming around the halos. And the smell immediately hit me when I walked in the door. And I, I just, I was very slow. My eyes were everywhere, right? You've got to remember that I grew up in a church that had no icons. Churches I've had had no icons. Blank white walls. You'd be lucky to have a cross in the back, maybe. But most of the time, it was nothing. And so it was more like an entertainment space, right? There was always a stage. And there were always, like, movable chairs. And there were, like, you know, things on the stage, like, you know, amplifiers and musical equipment and pianos and things like that, right? And easels and stuff like that. But people could just walk right in, go right up on the stage. There was no separation of holiness anywhere. And we used to tell, you know, our kids when we were younger, you know, don't run in church. You know, that was one, that was, a, when I was a kid, I must say, my parents were like, don't run in church. You know, that's a bad thing. I think it was more safety in, in, than anything else. I can remember having stitches in my tongue from running and hitting my head on the pew, you know. But you don't run in church because it's pious, right? We don't run in church because we're calm, we're peaceful. There's nowhere that Jesus ran. Jesus never ran anywhere. Right? We don't run a church, right? So the church is a place of holiness. It's a place where we keep it separate. We do things differently, right? 
the altar servers are just getting used to this. You know, when they come in, there's certain things that you do when you walk into the Orthodox Church. You don't just walk in and, you know, kind of sit down and slouch around and, you know, wait for the service to start, drink your coffee. But no, you, you come in with a sense of piety. Maybe you start by lighting a candle and thinking, who am I going to light a candle for? And then you venerate icons as you come in as well. We start with the center icon and we venerate Christ and the Mother of God. And then perhaps you have other saints that are special to you that are pictured here in the room. Many of your own patron saints are here. And you should venerate those icons and ask for their prayers. This becomes a family, a giant family of both the living and the proposed. <clears throat> those who have gone to be with the Lord are with us in spirit. And they are here, even pictured in these icons. This is a place of holiness. So when I first came to the Orthodox Church, my jaw was dropped, you know. I was like, what in the world? This is, this is something like I've never seen. And you can imagine when I went back the next day to go to my church, and I walked in, and I was just like, oh, what am I missing here, you know? And so I made my journey to come to the Orthodox faith. Because I saw that it had something holy, something special. The Mother of God leads us into this holiness. Now today, we, of course, can go in and out of our altars. With purpose and meaning, we can. In the early church, everybody went into the altar. Women, men, everybody went right into the altar and received communion. Mainly for practical purposes, we brought it out and put it onto a spoon so people weren't taking it home and worshiping it or you know, doing other weird things, which they did. <laughs> but instead, we, we organized it and, we, and the church was able to see in its wisdom what needed to be done to make it uh, just right. So we maintain the holiness of the church. We have the outer temple, the main, the inner temple, and the holy of holies, the place where, as you see, even on the altar there, there's a little tabernacle in the middle. And that's where the body and blood of the Lord rests all the time. It's always there. So that when someone is sick or ill or cannot come to church, I can go and bring them this reserved sacrament and bring them Holy Communion. The Holy Communion of the church is the power of the church. It is the might of the church. It is the strength of the church because it is God himself incarnate come to be with us. This is why Mary went into the Holy of Holies. She's teaching us. Says she's the prelude of God who was to come. Who would then later, what do I do every Sunday, right? I come out of those doors with the Holy Gift, bringing it out to the people. Every single aspect of the church's worship has meaning and purpose. Every single aspect of the church is biblical. Look at your Divine Liturgy book. It's not written there, but every single phrase in the Divine Liturgy can be taken from Holy Scripture. You can find it in Holy Scripture. So our service is biblical and scriptural, and it's pious and holy. We try to keep it that way. You know, there are times when little ones don't always make it that way, though, right? Sometimes the little guys don't understand because they're learning. And that's okay. We're also a place of learning. We're a place that helps them. And we don't get disturbed. But instead, we know they're going to grow in faith, right? The church is also a hospital for that very reason. Because it ministers to you. It listens to you. It hears from God. And it's a way that we can hear from God. You know, most of the miracles and many of the incredible visions that happen in the church happen in this service among the faithful. And it's not always the priest. Sometimes a priest has a vision. Sometimes it's a lay person. We have an icon of the protection of the mother of God back in the back. And you can see in the back there's some laymen who actually saw a vision of the mother of God in church. Blessing that church and proclaiming protection on them. These are the kind of things, brothers and sisters, that we have to awaken to, right? Instead of coming to church with a glaze over your mind, come to church expecting. Come to church running up the stairs like the mother of God, right? Going right into church boldly because you know that God is here. This is the feast. It's the feast, really, of the mother of God dedicating the temple, right? Dedicating herself, who would be the temple of the living God. 
and then also be the temple that we are called to be, right? She had to be that temple too. She took Christ in her, but she later had to take the resurrected Christ into her heart. She had to take the resurrected Christ and make him living in her as well, just as we do. And she models that for us, even at three years old. <laughs> Children, brothers and sisters, can teach you. If you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear, they will teach you great things. So let's let the mother of God at her little age of three teach us too to remember the temple, to keep the place of God holy. Even in your home, you should have a place that is meant for holiness. And let's model this to our children as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever.